and the water. Uh, it feels like I'm sitting in a kettle. Oh dear, dear, dear. I've spent 20 years crossing the world's most severe deserts and jungles. But I've never tackled the extreme cold. Now, my aim was to survive in the Arctic with dogs, cross the Bering Strait, and to film it all myself. I was nearing the end of my one and a half thousand kilometer trek with my translator, two native hunters, and their dog teams. Within days, I was going to be alone with my own dogs, heading out into the Bering Strait. We come across a family of nomads and their reindeer herd out in the middle of the tundra. Seeing people not just passing through this wilderness, but making it their home gave me hope that maybe I could survive alone out here if only my dog stood by me. Almost everything this nomad family use comes from their reindeer, food, clothing, and shelter. Whenever they need anything, they close in on their herd, looking for a suitable animal to bring down. The herder's relationship with their reindeer is not just one way. They constantly move the herd to new areas of good grazing and guard them from wolves. I wanted to find out more about how they lived, so I asked Anatol, the father of the family. How many reindeer skins do you think it takes to make a Yuranga? We can count them. <laughs> Где-то около 20 шкур. 20, uh -huh. And how long does it take you to put up the Yuranga? Ну, можно быстро построить, можно за два часа, и все полностью закрыть Yuranga. Is this the worst winter you can remember? Зима. Самая худшая. Самая худшая. Ну, еще, ну, провалете же еще хуже. Mm-hmm. We had a week's journey to our final destination, the whaling settlement of Lorena, home to the dogs and to my guides, Yasha and Tolia. We were going to cross onto the frozen sea and travel up the coast. After that, I'd be on my own. I was getting nervous at the thought of it. There'd be no Chuchi guides to help me then. We took a short cut and crossed onto the sea, arriving at a chain of small, uninhabited islands, pounded by the wind. Yet even in what was the coldest and windiest place I'd been so far, there were signs that people had lived out here. All across the landscape were jawbones of whales, set up like an arctic stonehenge. These are thought to be 600 years old, but what they were for, no one knows. There is nowhere else like this in the entire arctic. I counted 14 standing and many more on their side in the snow. 
Maybe it was an ancient religious site. The whales were, and still are, crucial to existence out here. But most important to me was that they were a symbol of people who not only survived, but thrived. I'm worried about the flashy white. Should be out there, along with Top Dog, front row, pulling ahead of everyone else. But he's lagging. He's actually been pulled slightly by Top Dog. So that is very worrying, not just for him, but uh, for me, because nine dogs are not enough for this journey. And it's times like this when you start looking around, wondering about the potential of Blot, Bernard, Jack, Basil, young Basil. Can the others pull together? Can they pull enough to keep us going? But for the moment, Flash White will be all right. Just have to uh, keep watching him, making sure he's not in distress. This is a cruel landscape. No trees for a thousand kilometers, and the valley sides shattered into strange shapes by the explosive force of winter temperatures. Suddenly, the first signs that we were nearing Lorena. <laughs> we have oncoming dog traffic. <laughs> Behave yourselves, dogs. <laughs> I thought that was going to be a major pile-up, um, <laughs> but uh, Yasha was whistling from ahead, so my dogs get their concentration. It's more than two months now since the dogs set out from Lorena, and now here they are approaching home again, and uh, they're excited. They know they're home, and. Uh, I don't need to steer. Okay. Everything's strapped down. Now's the time when I have to make sure everything is secure because this is never an easy ride coming into a settlement. Anywhere where there's a sniff of another dog. Even after over two months with the dogs, I was still terrified trying to control my team as I headed into Lorena. Not only were there lots of smells and other dogs, but this was their home. The people in the town didn't know what was about to hit them. Uh. Uh. Mayhem. I should knock over one drunk. tally of one drunk almost knocked over, one drunk definitely knocked over, and uh, three ladies terrified out of their wits, and uh, about 26 little dogs which uh, ran for their lives and are still recovering somewhere. I'd imagined something different. It was just another run-down Russian-built town crumbling back into the frozen earth. It seemed an incongruous place for Yasha and Tolia, who were so at home in the tundra, to live in. No one's going to be very happy here for me saying this, but this community, like virtually all the others I've seen, is uh, it's a sad one at heart. I mean, OK, a lot of joy here, a lot of laughter, but the whole community is affected, and every community I've visited is living off vodka. These are uh, a damaged people. They were uh, wrenched away from their communities, their little settlements, Eskimos, Chuchis, and they were shoved together 
in these Soviet fantasy houses which last 20, 30 years and now the Soviet system has collapsed and what are these people left with? Well, they're left with the vodka and sometimes I feel uh, I'm the only sober person in the community and it is such a relief just to get away from everyone a whole lot and sit with my dogs. In fact, dogs may be the salvation of Lorena. There are over 70 teams, that's 800 working dogs. And everyone who's sober rounds up stray dogs to build teams. There's little petrol, no money, and no jobs. People are having to become self-sufficient once again. When they hunt seals on the ice, they have to use dog power, leaving their petrol-starved snowmobiles behind. From here, I was going to set off on my own with my team. Two months ago, they had been anonymous and aggressive balls of fur. Now, I knew them individually. But I wanted to know more about them, and there's one person in Lorena who could help me. Standing beside me is someone I've been wanting to meet for quite a long time, and it's the owner of the dogs. So he's got the key to not only their personalities, but their names. And Bugai. Bugai. Yeah, yeah. Your flashy white. It's uh, four. Four? Ah. Good. Good, da, yeah, yeah. Ah. And it's a Pachukotsky. Ichkatu. Bele Litsu. Ichkatu. Ichkatu. Uh huh. Yes, six. Six years old. Ah. Ichkatu. Da, da, da. Uh, I'm glad I didn't know his Chikoka name because I wouldn't be able to say it. I think Top Dog is easier. Edda, Kushi, Kate, Wow, Wow, Radio. Right. That's you, isn't it? But Bernard, yes, yeah, so Kaksavud. Edda, Kargesh. 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 Not Piatnish, this Kargesh. 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 So, um, <laughs> he's, um, a school car good. Um, yeah. Yeah. Seven. Seven? Yeah, yeah. Seven only? Yeah. Bernard, he's only seven years old. What a fraud. There was I thinking he was a sort of old gent. He just behaves like a dog that's ancient. A little bit old before his time. To me, bumbling Bernard would always be Bernard. Certainly not fast paws. <laughs> Yasha was against the whole idea of my going off alone. But he agreed to take me up the coast and point me in the right direction. On my last day, he took me to Lorena's main attraction. There's a strange irony somewhere here. Lorena hasn't got a single working bathtub, but the tundra has, because this is a hot spring, and even with all the snow, minus whatever it is, it's steaming away here. It looks really unpleasantly hot. <laughs> right, I'm going to give it a go. But um, Yasha isn't. Yasha knew this. Oh, no. I've been lured here. I was thinking uh, it's going to be a bonding session. Us men. It's just me. <laughs> right. It's too hot. Uh, I can't stand it. Uh, uh, the air is minus 15, minus 20. <laughs> and the water, uh, it feels like I'm sitting in a kettle. Oh dear, dear, dear. <laughs> uh, that's the trouble with not having had a bath for over three months. 
Oh dear. Also, I feel I'm sitting in a pool of old poppy doms. This is uh, algae, I suppose. <laughs> Although it could be the slime or remains of uh, numerous other bathers who've boiled here. <laughs> there was no putting it off any longer. I was about to find out just how much I'd learned over the last few months. Alexei now revealed that my route followed the course of the annual polar bear migration. He told me what to do if a polar bear attacked. А также, если это не получится, придется тебе отцеплять ну, пару собак, чтобы они медведя задержали, а ты вот просто. I can't promise, but I'll try and get your dogs back safely. Oh, I will promise. I'll, I'll get the dogs back. <laughs> and I'll come back as well. Ну, это для меня самое главное. Yes. Потому что они собаки меня кормят. Я работаю вместе с ними все время. Я хочу с ними. Они все время со мной, и я вместе с ними. Я вырос вместе с ними, а хочу работать. So this was it. Ten days supplies for me and the dogs, but unfortunately, no gun. As a foreigner, I wasn't even allowed to be alone in this sensitive border area, let alone carry a weapon. I'd only take a flare pistol, not to call for help. There was no one near who could help me anyway but to try to scare wolves and polar bears away. This was what I'd been building up to for three months. The dogs were keen and fit, but they didn't know where I was taking them, nor that Yasha would be leaving us after a few hours. I just hoped that they wouldn't desert me when they discovered that this wasn't a day trip. My route from Lorena would take me up the coast and then hopefully out into the Bering Strait. Then, depending on the state of the ice and currents, I would cross over to Alaska, if the polar bears let me. That was a rather pointed reminder from uh, Alexei back there. I should uh, make sure I get the dogs back because uh, that's his livelihood. Um, yeah, of course it's true, but um, of course I know that. <laughs> Every now and again you might just be able to hear a little yelp of surprise from one of Yasha's dogs. And that is the result of a little pebble hitting its bum flung by Yasha with all the accuracy you'd expect of a harpoonist. Yasha has stopped up ahead. I don't know if he's just going to the loo or whether he wants a tea break. <laughs> Спасибо. Uh, see you, Lorna. Не, я сначала Лаурентий там шлип, а потом говорю. Окей. Я Лорна. 
потом. Экспедиция небольшая. No, 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 no. Little. No, it's, yeah. Чтобы в 9 часов, а то темнеет. Ага. Ну, кому? Что? H. H. О, да, sun. Sun, окей. Right, a reminder that the sun goes down at 8. Okay, and I've said it's going to be a small expedition, not a big one. So, what have we <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh. See you go. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> hey. 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 Yeah. Hey. Hey. Spasiba. Yeah, sure. Spasiba, sure. Yes, yes, yes. Yasha, definitely going home now, and I'm definitely on my own. And I feel relieved. It's up to me now, and uh, the polar bears, and the wolves, and the weather, and the ice. Sooner or later, I had to get to this stage. It's no good just sitting back in London, dreaming about being out here alone, wondering what it's really like. Well, uh, now's my chance to find out. Doesn't it make you sick? You're all watching Asher. I'm your master. I was finally alone. In this frozen emptiness, there was an acute silence. No towns, no people, no radio communication. Just me, the dogs, and my camera. I feel really bad, actually, because Yasha said to me, small expedition, not big one, and it was more like a command than a question. And I said, oh, small expedition, yes, yes, yes. But I haven't come all this way just to do a little expedition. I just can't. I have to push myself and the dogs. We'll just be careful, but um, we are going to go out there and uh, push ourselves. I'm sorry, Asha. This was the real test. Without the dog god Yasha, would they respond to my commands and trust me as we headed further and further away from their home and safety? Sunset, and the dogs have decided it's time to go home. And they're not going home, not today, not till our job's done. Right. Let's try it again. Tak, 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 tak. Tak, 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 tak. We can't allow this. I said, tak, tak. That's better. Uh, starting to get chilly. The sun is going down. And it's around now you start looking at these blocks of ice and wondering if they really are blocks of ice. I'm sure I've seen several move. <laughs> Rick, Rick. Uh, I think we'll call it a day here. The sun is about to go. Uh, 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 uh. Well done, dogs. Okay. First rule is always look after the dogs first. However, there's no point in me dying because uh, then I won't be able to look after them. So shelter, then 
supper time for the dogs, and eventually supper time for me. Bernard, it's no good looking wistfully at home. Bernard, Bernard. No, no, it's, no, no. You have to forget about her. Bernard. Bernard wasn't the only one who wanted to go home. If there was one thing that would keep the dogs with me, it was food. I was their only source. My biggest nightmare was waking up one morning and finding them gone. And even in the daytime, if they set their minds to it, there would be nothing I could do to stop them. Even now, if they took the sledge and supplies with them, I might not be able to make it home on foot. temperature's dropping very rapidly. It feels like about one degree every five minutes. It was getting too cold to be out in the wind. Before turning in, I made one final check to see that the dogs were properly secured. My dogs were on edge. Something was wrong. Something's cropped up. Uh, I'd call it an emergency, maybe a crisis, uh, don't know quite. I saw something out there and I don't know what it was. It was maybe a wolf, maybe a polar bear. It was something and uh, it's moving across from south to north, about 100 meters away. It's hardly any light at all now. I'm gonna get this uh, stress flare thing in operation. I'd feel better if I had a target. I'd do better if I had a target as well. I hope. I keep expecting to see pair of eyes reflected in my torchlight. Well, I'm not going to wait out here to be pounced on. It's far too cold. You can come get me in my tent. I'm all curled up in my sleeping bag waiting for the wolf attack, or the polar bear attack. Whichever one it is, I hope it happens soon, because I'm getting tired waiting. Got my armament. Uh. Right, that's it. Can't stand it anymore, I'm going to sleep. Can't hang around, you know. I keep waking up hearing this growling noise. And then I realise it isn't that the polar bear has come, it's just Bernard. I suppose it's a comfort having him out there. It's a comfort having all the dogs out there, not having them in the tent. But uh, they will act as my alarm. I'd made it through the first night. There'd been no attack, and my dogs had stuck with me. Jack had even snuggled up against my tent for protection. A polar bear would have shredded the tent or my dog team in seconds. And even ten toughened dogs were no match for the huge Arctic wolf. tracks. There was just one and he was heading that way right past my camp. Either the dogs didn't hear him, didn't sense him, or they simply chose not to react. And I think they chose not to react.
I was heading up the coast, following it for 130 kilometers until I got to the Bering Strait. Once there, I would cut out onto the frozen sea and have to contend with the shifting currents and contorted ice as I headed towards Alaska. Here, there were no settlements for miles, just steep cliffs and jumbled ice. And the harder the going was, the harder it would be to get back if things went wrong. Oh, the Moffat dogs. They're looking more and more despondent as we head further and further from home. All the dogs wanted to do was go home, but unbelievably, they were now actually obeying my orders. I was placing all my hope in the two lead dogs, Top Dog and the strong but dim Flashy White. Nunyamo, a decade ago, a thriving village of 500 people. Despite the efforts of its population, the elements won the battle and everyone retreated south to the larger settlements. With a wind chill of minus 50, I had to find a sheltered spot to put my tent up. Out of the wind, it was a mild minus 15, and as long as the wind didn't shift direction, I'd be okay. Just a gust from nowhere, trying to blow me away. And now, total calm. Uh, I should get up, but I forgot to put snow out ready for me to melt. That means I've got to go out there and gather it. And until I do that, I won't have anything to drink, let alone Nice cup of tea to warm me up. I was rapidly losing strength. Dehydration is one of the biggest killers in the Arctic. I had to get up and get moving. The dogs just slept through it all. Just as I was trying to get my stove, my tent was almost blown away. It needed my weight in it to keep it anchored. If I lost my tent, I'd have no shelter, and that could be fatal. I'd have to stay inside and hope that the wind died down before I became seriously dehydrated. The wind kept building over the next five hours. Getting seriously thirsty now. I'm starting to feel a little bit weak. Um, uh, I could keep munching snow, uh, but it's very cold, obviously, and it's playing havoc with my fillings. Uh, no, more to the point, it'll lower my body temperature if I keep on taking this stuff. All around me was frozen water, but without a stove to melt it, I couldn't drink. It was lack of fuel and the resulting dehydration that so fatally weakened Captain Scott and his men. Right. I'm going to try and get my stove working, because... Well, because I have to. <laughs> and if I can't do it out here on the porch of the tent, then I'll try it inside the tent. It'd be a shame to lose my accommodation, but uh, if the tent goes up in flames, then so be it.
Ooh. <laughs> yeah, we have. Whoa. My reindeer skin's gonna go off. In a minute. on the boil. Ah, I'm a going concern again. <laughs> the weather's cleared, wind is dropping, just for the moment at least, and I think we better make a break for it. We've got to strike out now, otherwise we're not going to stand a chance of getting to the Bering Strait. This was the most dangerous bit of the expedition. There are stories of native people having crossed the Bering Strait, and one Russian claims to have done it, though none of the locals believe him. There is no record of anyone having crossed it here at the narrowest but most turbulent point. Beneath me was water, and there was no knowing how thick the ice was. In the morning, I'd been desperate for water. Now, I was dreading it. It's not looking very promising in terms of traveling with dogs. There are avenues through these walls, these pressure ridges, but they're few and far between. The going was now so tough that I had to go ahead alone to find a route for the dogs and sledge. It weighed 200 kilos, so I had to be sure the ice was thick enough. I could hardly believe it when the lead dogs began to follow the scent I'd left. At last, the dogs were trusting me. This was how it was going to be from now on. A quarter of a kilometer an hour was good going. And the further out to sea I went, the more dangerous it was becoming. At this rate, it would take me weeks even to get halfway across the Bering Strait, far longer than my provisions would last. I realized there was no way we were going to make it and survive. I've got a problem, and uh, it's a serious one. I went ahead to try and find a way through the ice blocks and left the dogs, left the sledge, and I can't find my way back. Right, on the face of it, that is a disaster, but uh, it's not the end of the world. It's not the end of my world, I hope, because uh, I've got my survival kit, and uh, that's partly why I walk around like old Mother Hubbard, staggering about. But it's moments like this when you suddenly think, oh my God, thank goodness I have uh, got my survival kit with me because it's such a bore normally. But I'm really grateful just at the moment. Uh, I'll keep trying to retrace my tracks. Some of this ice is it's like an ice cube, except very large, with no snow on it. So, um, uh, there are no tracks. I should have marked the sledge better. I was 160 kilometers from the nearest human. Without the dogs and sledge, it may as well have been a thousand. It would take me 10 days to walk home. My emergency supplies would last me only four. No one knew where I was. Keeping filming was a way of keeping calm.
still no sign. I think I've got about an hour left and then I better stop, find a little shelter behind ice and uh, I don't know, hide, hide down, duck down for the night, start again tomorrow morning. No luck finding the dogs and my sledge and my supplies. No good looking in this darkness. But I found this uh, little hovel. Very, very pleased. I could sleep in the back chamber. In there. What are the dogs doing now? I hope they're just sitting, waiting patiently, not giving up on me. There's a chance that they've left, uh, made a run for it, and that may be why I can't find them, but I like to think they've stayed and they're waiting for me. Okay, it's not beginning of a nightmare. No, 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 no. I need this stove. You know what the problem is? Dirty Russian fuel. Probably bought on the black market by Yasha. Temperature's dropping all the time. Uh, I can't afford to keep on messing around with the stove. My camera was my only company. It was reassuring to have something to talk to. Hope I see my dogs again. I hope they're waiting for me. Okay, I'm gonna curl up. Got through the night, it seems. My hands are bad, very, very cold. Uh, not frostbite, I don't think. But I'm having to curl them up and keep pumping them. Keep those fingers working. Let's start looking for the dogs. I'll give it two, three hours and then better give up and try and get out of here myself. Maybe I can get help. I searched for hours looking for tracks, trying to remember ice shapes, anything that would lead me to the dogs. They wouldn't survive without me feeding them. By the time I got help, if I could get help, they would be dead. <laughs> Never guess what I can see right in front of me. Not a moment too soon. Ah. Right, a cup of coffee. Uh, 
water, anything. Whew. Right. <laughs> oh, they waited. And <laughs> here they are. I've missed you. Have you missed me? I was so tired and dehydrated, I could hardly walk, let alone show any emotion. As usual, the dog showed nothing, saving energy as a survival strategy. Yeah. We're back on track. <laughs> I fed the dog some extra walrus, and after I'd eaten, we left for the final push. I'd already come such a long way with the dogs, but I wanted to get as far as I could before having to turn around for the long journey home. For me, the dog staying there was the real triumph, suddenly more important than crossing the Bering Strait. They hadn't deserted me and had been sure I'd come back for them. Oh, dogs, you won't believe it. It's terrible out there, <laughs> and that's where we're meant to be going. Uh, Jack, Frank, top dog, flashy white. These are my friends, these are my companions, these are my professional colleagues, and they've pretty well got me there. This is the Bering Strait. Uh, we can go home. <laughs> uh, and it's about time too. Look at them. Totally exhausted. I know someone will be happy we're going home. Bernard. Aren't you pleased you're here at the final moment of victory? <laughs> I know I shouldn't make dogs seem like humans because they're not. But I'm delirious with tiredness and uh, with contentment. Phew. Oh, Bernard, what am I going to do without you? It started with a kiss. No, no, no. It didn't start with a kiss. And it's not going to end with one either. Uh, I'll give him a little pat. Maybe a hug. But, uh, oh, I'm pleased. They haven't let me down. That's the most important thing for me. They didn't abandon me. Instead, they guided me here. And I couldn't have asked for more. It was amazing to think that America was only 120 kilometers away. So close. Yet this year, an impossible journey. It had been the coldest winter in living memory, but the winds and currents had made the ice uncrossable. I was physically shattered, and my supplies were desperately low. I had to turn back. The long journey back to Lorena showed me that finally, after months, the dogs were treating me as their leader. It was an incredible feeling finally being at home in such a dangerous environment. We were almost back home and arriving as a team. Three months ago, the dogs were just anonymous, aggressive animals. Now, they were all individuals with their own strengths and weaknesses. They knew me and trusted me to look after them. <laughs> yes. Nothing's going to stop the dogs now. They know their home, they smell it, they see it. And uh, what a relief for them. <laughs> uh, what a relief for me. I feel like I'm handing back the keys of an expensive but very exciting sports car, not having pranged it. Because at last we are here, Lorena, home. And uh, the dogs are safe and sound. And uh, that responsibility is off my hands. Uh, sad though.
Nothing much had changed in Lorena. So far, the welcome has been rather subdued, but is Yasha still alive? <laughs> it amazed me that Yasha had enough faith in me returning to have even bothered to buy champagne. Okay. <laughs> so this is to celebrate me having survived, according to Yasha. Russian? Russian. Uh, Russian one? Uh, no, yeah, special, special Russian vodka. This. Yeah, uh, champagne. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. How can I? It's not. It's, it's, can't fool Yasha. This is not vodka. Thank you. It's champagne. Yes. Right. Ooh. Oh, God! What oh. dark at least. <laughs> <laughs> ah. <laughs> Yo. Yeah. Beda. Oh, he worrying. Oh. Beda. Oh, but how does it suggest? How does it But it's perceiver. <laughs> Within days, the spring arrived. The snow began to melt and great cracks appeared in the sea ice. It was the end of winter and the dog season. Bernard and the others could look forward to a lazy summer, fattening themselves up for the next winter. I'll miss these animals. I don't know if they'll miss me, but uh, I don't even want to say goodbye. Maybe I won't because it'll end up as a one-way conversation. <laughs> They've got uh, their world and I've got my world, but it was good to be in their world just for a few months. Off goes Dennis. Another goodbye. Bernard, maybe your turn next. Why am I fond of this dog? Doesn't even look like a proper Siberian effort. <laughs> uh, I don't know, something about him. Something very huggable. And at the same time, something not very huggable. He's so aloof. Anyway, I'll try and say goodbye to Bernard at least. Bernard. Raise your head and say something. Right. <laughs> That's all we're going to get. But that is so Bernard, and it shouldn't be any other way. <laughs> Absolutely no response at all. Bye bye, Bernard, anyway. Stay with us here on BBC4. Dirk gently finds himself the prime suspect in a murder case from his almost...